right. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Maria Moran Chandi, Executive Director of the National Institute for the Advancement of Education, or NIAE, here at UNLV. Um, welcome to the today's Scholarship in Practice webinar. The Scholarship in Practice web lecture series is a forum hosted by the University of Nevada, Las Vegas College of Education, and it is offered to local and national communities to discuss critical issues and propose concrete solutions on topics related to PK-20 education and mental health. Today's topic is educational wellness in the Nevada legislative session. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about the National Institute for the Advancement of Education. Uh, we explore education innovations that serve as models nationally and internationally, leveraging the richly diverse context of our communities and we aim to transform education through innovation, excellence, evidence, and equity. Today, uh, joining me is Ms. Patricia Haddad, Director of Government Relations for the Clark County School District, the fifth largest school district in the country that is located in Southern Nevada. And she's an organizer, strategist, and advocate, and has an impressive track record in community and government relations. And I've had the pleasure of working with her in the past, and I'm very appreciative that, uh, of her being here with us today. And Patricia, do you want to say a few words, uh, introduce yourself? Certainly. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Patricia Haddad. Um, uh, just really, really excited to join you all today. Zooming in from a fabulous office in Carson City, um, where it is snowing a little bit, hailing a little bit, and then very icy at the same time. Um, but, but truly, you know, excited to join this conversation today. Um, <clears throat> we're in week three of the legislative session. We, we've are learning a lot, and and we'll dive into to sort of the timing and what all of that looks like. But you know, my background has really been focused on. Um, policies related to children, family, and education throughout my entire career. Um, I spent a little bit of time at UNLV with the Nevada Institute for Children's Research and Policy, looking at child maltreatment prevention, child sexual abuse prevention, and a whole myriad of other issues in relation to kids and families. And I am a College of Ed grad um, okay. <laughs> ed in um, uh, specific learning disabilities and, and emotional behavioral disorders. Um, and I'm really excited to, to join this conversation. Um, outside of work, I do organize with some different groups, um, Nevadans for the Common Good, really looking at broad-based organizing and, and really taking a look at what is it that we can do collectively as a community to strengthen our social safety net, to strengthen education, to strengthen all of these components that make really, really good, excellent communities to live in. And so that's a bit of the lens that I bring with you today. And um, I'm, I'm really excited to dive in. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. I'm very glad you're, you're here today. And I would like to, before we begin kind of diving into the topic, just talk about the general agenda so that folks that are joining us understand what we're going to be doing today. We're going to uh, highlight just some key education and wellness initiatives that are currently on the horizon for the 82nd Nevada State Legislature. And we'll talk in very general terms about the platforms for both CCSD and UNLV, as well as go over uh, some other information about the process and, and tracking bills and how to contact representatives and other items that we will cover very generally. Yeah, and and um, so I, I, what I'm hoping that we can do just on the front end, and probably because we're using this webinar platform um, in the Q and A might be the easiest part, but would love to know, you know, where are you walking into this conversation? Um, do you feel like you're an expert in this? Do you feel like you? Um, uh, uh, sort of know a bit about the process? Do you feel like you don't know anything about the process? Feel free to just drop generally in the chat, um, you know, how you're feeling. And because what we want to also do is dive into, like Maria said, the overall process. How do you contact your legislators, right? And we can really dive into the minutia or we can keep it super high level, just depending on, on um, the audience's uh, uh, experience level as well. Um, so also feel free to use the Q&A 
you know, as we're going, this is very much going to be a conversation as, as we move um, forward in, in, in this webinar. Um, feel free to drop in comments or questions, you know, as we're going and um, we will do our best to monitor. I'm sure as you all know, it's hard to vacillate right between the two, but we'll do our best to take pause points and monitor for questions and make sure that we can, can share from there as well. And then we'll leave some time at the end for some dedicated uh, question time. Um, let's see. Okay. So let's see. I'm seeing some folks drop in the chat, basic information. Nevada is new, a little on the easy, earlier side of understanding, um, aware of some general conversations that are happening. Okay. Okay. This is helpful. So, so we're, we're, uh, very much. It looks like no, in general, sort of what this process looks like, but but maybe we'll spend some time navigating and, and helping navigate around the, the, the Nevada legislative website as well from there. Perfect. Um, sounds good. And then like, uh, like you said, Patricia, we want to make this interactive. So please, uh, we'll monitor as best as we can. And uh, we're going to kind of start generally, and then we can uh, start focusing as we move forward. And um, I know if there are any uh of the folks joining us that very experienced legislative act advocates. Uh, we are gonna cover some um, basic topics, but we do encourage you to also write to us or, or, or put in the, the chat and the Q&A some suggestions for topics for future, uh, or you could also uh, send us um, an email both at the UNLV College of Ed or at the Institute, and we will be happy to um, continue the conversation. If there are any questions that you felt unanswered today, we are happy and available to answer those questions. So wonderful. So um, I know Patricia has some really good information about the legislative process, but to begin, just to want to cover some basic facts about the legislation legislature here in Nevada. So here we have a biennial legislative session, and that means that our members uh, meet officially every two years on odd number of years for 120 days in our regular session. There are occasions where there can be um, a, a special session called by the governor, which could extend the period of time that they're meeting, but the regular session is 120 days. And of course, the Nevada legislators continue their work uh, through interim study and advisory committees and in between sessions. It is considered a citizen legislature, which that uh, it basically means that legis legislators have full-time jobs. And then when the legislature convenes, they, um, can, they convene in Carson City to do the work of this, the, the legislature. So, and uh, the 82nd legislative session started uh, on Monday, February 6th. So they're uh, just getting started. Uh, it's been a very busy legislative session so far, but, uh, and, you know, it, we have... Uh, around 40, well, we have 42 members in the assembly and in the Senate, 21 representatives. Uh, and these representatives are democratically elected to their positions. Uh, senators are elected to four-year terms uh, while members of the assembly are elected to two-year terms. So that's just very generally how the assembly structure is. And Patricia, do you wanna uh, cover some of the basic information that uh, you have? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, um, yeah, and and I think this is something that was a surprise to me when I realized I'm like, why am I voting for assembly people every two? It's because they only have two year terms. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> um, unlike the senators that are that are on four year terms. And now there's a really excellent resource, um, especially redistricting just happened. Right, it happens every ten years after the census and the boundary lines for excuse me, Senate, Assembly, Congress, right, all the political boundary lines get moved around. And so I encourage you, even if you maybe think that you know who your legislator was from previous years to, to jump on to the Who's My Legislator website. And then, all right, I'm going to do a really dangerous thing. I'm going to try to share my screen here. Um, and at the Who's My Legislator website, hopefully y'all can see that, um, there is essentially an interactive map that you can type your address into. And so, and then that will, um, show you who represents your area. So what I'm going to do is type in the address for the CCSD central office and, oh, come on. 
here we go. And that zooms me in on the map. And then what this lays out are all of the representatives. So U.S. House of Representatives. And then what I can see here is my state senator in this area is Rochelle Nguyen. And then my state assembly person, that representative is Sabra Newby. And I think one thing to keep in mind is that our Senate districts are bigger and nested within those Senate districts are as multiple assembly districts, essentially. So um, just something to keep in mind. So you're represented by both, of course, Board of Regents will, will pop up here as well. Um, so I think that's a really great tool. And what I can do is I'm going to drop this link into the chat for everyone to be able to see. I'm going to pause for a second. Go ahead and click the link if you're somewhere where you're able to do that. Um, and then uh, go ahead and type in your address or even you know, your school, your child, the school that your child attends. If you have kids in school, um, your workplace, just type in an address and give it, give it a shot. And we'll just give, I don't know, a minute for that. It's amazing with technology, we have information at the tip of our hands, you know, the uh, fingers. So it's, it's really, it's really uh, accessible and you can get a lot of information from these sites that we're going to show today. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, what's really important about knowing who your representative is, and maybe this is like a truism, right? I, I don't know. But what's really important about knowing who your representative is, is that is really your primary touch point in many ways for getting involved in the legislative session. The person that you vote for, that you're a constituent of, um, and they really um, have an obligation to be responsive to you uh, in many ways, right? And and, and, and are super good about getting, especially always mention, by the way, I'm reaching out to you and I'm a constituent. Um, mm -hmm. It's very helpful for getting a call back. Uh, but ultimately, that, that is really a, a smart starting point for, for getting engaged, for taking a look um, at sort of what uh, a starting point for, for taking a look at what's happening overall in the session. Sure. And right now, obviously, the legislators are very busy in the legislative session, but they're open to constituents calling, uh, reaching out. We'll talk more about some of the ways you can get involved and provide your input feedback for the work that is happening today. But one of the wonderful things about Nevada, I believe, and this this has been raised by many people who come here and are new, and we have a couple of folks that are just coming here from other states, and you really do have access to your legislators. They they are in community um, meetings and community events. And so that's something that I've heard from other states. Uh, folks tell me I, I never thought I would see my legislator in a luncheon or uh, to run into them at the store. But it's it's one of the wonderful advantages of, of, uh, of Nevada that we have the ability to really, if we so desire, engage very directly with our representatives. Uh, I could not agree more truly with that. Um, you know, you'd be surprised when it comes down to a hearing, five people commenting on the same thing, uh, you know, with an aligned message truly does change the conversation. Um, so I think something to keep in mind throughout this exactly to the point um, that Maria was making is not only is there access, but there is true community influence that's possible. So, you know, as we're walking through this, like, you know, you are you know, a very integral part of this entire process, whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you're interested in. Um, so, so see, you know, see yourself in this as, as well would be how I would encourage you um, as we're continuing to move through this information. So hopefully everyone had a chance to take a look and type their ad address in and take a look to see who their representatives are. Um, and we will dive a little bit further into the legislative website in a moment. Um, but first, let's just talk about process. Is that is that OK, Maria? That sounds perfect. Thank you. Um, awesome. And then, of course, I just lost my um, page here as, as we're going. So um, process wise. It is an interesting Maybe sometimes simple, often very much sometimes complicated. I'm going to share my screen <laughs> again. Um, but if you think about how a bill becomes a law, 
going back to um, Schoolhouse Rock uh, and, you know, that I'm just a bill. It, it really is. It really is just about to that to that level. So the way that it works is, is there's an initial idea that comes up. And this is where we are here in this in this document that you're looking at in these initial steps that comes about either from someone out in the community that's reaching out to their legislator, um, from advocacy groups that are organizing and identifying specific types of policy that they'd like to see. And then there are also um, pre-file bills that government agencies and different commissions are able to submit. So for example, um, Clark County School District gets two bills at the start of each session that are fully ours to craft and to submit. And that gets posted on the legislative website um, for everyone to read and for the legislature to consider. Um, Clark County, the county government entity, entity, for example, I believe gets five bill drafts and, and someone correct me if I'm if I'm wrong on that piece. And so, you know, it starts there and, and it starts with just an idea, just an initial kind of headline, quite literally of, relates to education. And um, that's what you see is called a BDR, a bill draft request. Um, the Legislative Council Bureau, which is a, a nonpartisan group uh, that is within the legislature, that's part of the executive branch, helps write the actual language that you'll see in a bill based on the concepts and the ideas that are brought to them to be placed into it. Once you get the language, that's when you're really cooking with gas. Um, once the, the legislative session begins, which like Maria mentioned, it is 120 days every two years. So I'm sure you can imagine how uh, uh, insane and fast and furious the whole thing is. But ultimately, um, starting on day one and moving forward at a really high level, the process is the bill starts in one house. You've got your Senate and Assembly. Um, the bill will be assigned to one house. So for example, CCSD's bill, uh, Senate Bill 47, which is related to teacher workforce uh, and, and working conditions for folks in the education, uh, uh, public education sector. That was assigned to a Senate bill, uh, sorry, to, to, to the Senate. And so it gets a Senate bill number, it gets read on the floor of the Senate, which is when they all come together to read all the bills that get assigned. And then what happens is that gets assigned to a committee that is essentially looking at this type of issue. So CCSD's bill relating to educators and, and public education gets assigned to Senate and then the Senate Education Committee. That's the first place where it's heard. Um, and then, you know, so a presentation happens before that committee. We say, this is what it's about. This is what we're hoping to do. From there, uh, uh, you know, it may go into what's called work session, where the committee members will have a discussion about things that need to change. Um, and then hopefully you get, uh, th so they do a vote on it, hopefully. Um, they don't have to. And uh, uh, it goes, you know, back to the floor for a second reading. And then the full house, so everyone in the Senate would vote on whether or not to move it forward. And Maria, cut me off or, or stop me if, if uh, I'm going too quick here. Yeah, good. No, you're doing great. Thank you. Right. <laughs> um, so then from there, assuming that it gets passed and, and, and just to be to be very clear, every little break in this process that you're seeing, there is an opportunity for a bill to, and they call it a bill to die, which means not move forward in the process, which means not, you know, have a chance at becoming law. Um, because that's the goal here, right? To get something into NRS, which is the Nevada Revised Statutes, which is our, our legal code here in Nevada. And so hopefully you get through House number one, and then, oh, awesome. You get to do the same thing all over again in house number two on the other side. And I think the other thing to keep in mind throughout all of this is the negotiations, there are amendments, right? So a bill can look very different from this introduction and first reading um, than it does when it finally, ideally hits the governor's desk for signature. Um, so that's something I, I would keep in mind. So always taking a look at amendments, always seeing sort of what the conversation looks like specifically around legislation that you're really interested in. So 
um, to, to, to wrap this up at a high level. Again, you got house number one, hopefully you get it passed. Your bill doesn't die. Get house number two. Hopefully you get it passed and it doesn't die. Assuming there's no money involved (laughs) and everything passes on both floors, it gets to the governor's desk. And then the governor has the, uh, has the, the decision point to either sign it. It becomes law effective, whatever date is built into it or to veto it. And then it kind of goes back around and has it has another process the next legislative session around um, from there if if the legislature chooses or it just ends ends there. So lots of opportunities for things to change and lots of opportunities for things to go horribly wrong, um, but also to sure it up and make really good policy at the same time. So I'm going to stop sharing here and I'm going to share the link for this um for this particular image uh, for you all to have for yourselves. Thank you. And as you mentioned, I mean, that's one process, but if any of the bills um, require a budget, there's there's another additional process that needs to follow through that. So um, you you will see that uh, sometimes in the BDRs where folks are saying, well, what's the budget for this bill? But that's a different process that has to go through different finance committees and 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 um, is is similar in the sense of of, of how how it's moved through, but it, it is a separate for an allocation to happen. And uh, you'll see that when we talk a little bit more about some of the requests that we're seeing from the formal uh, legislative agendas, uh, at, at least for UNLV, we are requesting the support of the legislature to fund certain projects, and we'll talk more about that. Um, Maybe this is a pause point, Maria, for folks to drop in any questions before we move to some of this next information. Would that be okay? Sounds good. Okay. I think, yeah, if if you're um, holding on to a question, let's see. What requirements are there to get an emergency bill through? So um, maybe I'll do a little bit of interpretation. Emergency bill, maybe meaning something in, in regards to that wasn't planned ahead of time. And now we recognize that there's some urgency around making sure that that's gets through in this legislative session. Mm-hmm. Maybe does that seem. Yeah. The, to, yes. Could be something that maybe something that just happened and we need some, I mean, can I say yes? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Perfect. Oh, excellent. So legislators get a certain amount of bills that they themselves, each individual legislator, gets a certain amount of bills that they are allowed to carry themselves, right? Mm-hmm. To say, this is a, a bill sponsored by assembly person XYZ. And um, in addition to that, the the leaders of, of each house have a number of bills that they can add on top of that. Um, and then, I mean, essentially through the leadership process, um, there there is not a hard and fast deadline on when things can get pushed through. So like in in past sessions, we've seen things get introduced, pushed through committees and and back onto the floor for debate, you know, in the last week of of session that that you've had 120 days up to that point um, Mm -hmm. to put through. And so I would say requirements are um, exigent circumstance, a support um, of the the sort of right leadership folks to to put something together and put it through, and then a coalition of of legislators who are, are will you know sign on and vote for it, and then your community support as well, depending on what the topic is. Folks that are willing to turn out and um, talk about how that particular excuse me particular legislation might might be impacting them. Sure, and and two is that as we mentioned the legislator. Uh, leg- legislature meets 120 days, but the governor does have the power to call an emergency uh, session. And let's say if there were a major incident in the state that required some sort of legislative action, and it has happened in the past, um, then there's there's a, a process by which they can call an emergency session to consider bills or move some of the emergency bills that would be relevant. Um, this is not done lightly. Uh, also, the, 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 while the legislative responsibility falls with the legislature and the, the process of bill making is a, indeed part of that, the, the, that branch of government, sometimes depending on what the emergency is, the executive branch has ability to do temporary solutions and um, 
declare uh, certain things that can help aid in case of an emergency. Let's say if we, we had a situation that needed to be addressed immediately while the legislature was convened. Hopefully that answered the question. Any other, let's see, I'm not seeing any other questions. Mm -hmm. um, and again, feel free to continue to drop those in as, as we're moving along. Um, so, okay, so you've gotten a sort of quick and dirty on what's the process and, you know, who are all these people that are up here making decisions for me and everyone else <laughs> that impacts my day-to-day -day life. Um, but maybe uh, we can talk a little bit about what's happening uh, right now in this current legislative session. Sure. So we're in the second week and we uh, already... Great. Yeah, there are three, three weeks. So, so last week, right, we ended up with 363 uh, the, uh, bills on the docket. I don't um, have the number of today, but you might, Patricia, you might have it I right do, there. I do, I really <laughs> do. Um, so as of like an hour ago, there were 1,036 bill draft requests. So those were those headlines of ideas that folks have. Those don't always turn into bills, but it does take time for that language to be written. And so right now there are 431 bills available on the Nevada legislature website for you to peruse. Um, if you are having trouble sleeping, uh, that would be a great place to get some, some bedtime uh, uh, reading, uh, reading material. Yes. And, and the topics is are, are pretty broad on, on the kinds of bills that are are right now on the docket. There's uh, all sorts of, of, of topics in education, healthcare, um, uh, safety, workforce development, and, and, and there's many many things. Um, some I see a question here in uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, talking a little bit about introducing legislat legislation. Yeah. So so I, I'll take that if you don't mind. So sure, it just depends. Course. It depends on who the we is, I think, in your question. So if you're an agency or if you're an entity, the first thing would to, you know, if it's related to work, for example, mm -hmm. the first thing to do, obviously, whatever with whatever your internal processes are, you likely have a government relations person um, or touch point who will be leading um, uh, uh, drafting legislation if, if you have a certain amount um, for, for your agency and then working on getting that passed. If you are uh, speaking from, from a perspective as an individual, as a community member, the best thing to do is to reach out to your representative and say, hey, this is something that I care a lot about. This is something that I'd like to see changed. And um, legislators are always looking for those types of ideas. They, you know, Some of them have seven or eight bills that they're able to provide and they've got some of their things that they care about, but then they've got four empty bill drafts and they're like, come give me the ideas. Let's work on it together. So I would say as an individual, as a constituent, reaching out to the folks that represent you would probably be the best way to go about it. As a constituent, as, as an individual, I can't really speak to whether, you know, to the extent that legislative council bureau works with folks. I don't know the answer to that question, but certainly, um, once you know things are rolling and and, and legislation is getting drafted, um, they're they're just an incredible resource and, and and very easy to get in touch with and and get you know general questions answered. A big part of their role also is doing research for the legislators, right? Who have an idea but need some clarification, and they'll reach out to all of the interested parties and say, "Hey, can you you know let me know about." workforce, you know, development inside of, you know, or, or let's say uh, like CTE schools generally, can you give me more information? About, and then they'll provide that to the legislator. Yeah. Um, and, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, like you said, I think if, if it's something, let's say that you worked at UNLV and you had an idea for a bill, then that the appropriate channel would be to talk to our government and community relations folks and um, work with them to bring in your ideas. But let's say also um, if you have any professional organizations that are attached to your profession, they have a, um, you know government relation arms that work in together to propose legislature re regarding, for example, counselors association or um, you know some of the the different representatives for like the, the the school district teachers union or you know we have so depends on what you want to do. It's also good to talk to uh, folks in organizations or entities that have already 
um, don't work because you will find that sometimes uh, you have this wonderful idea and something similar may have been tried before. And so then you don't have to start from scratch. It could be that in collaboration with these organizations, you can uh, move some of these ideas through so, um, so that you can do that work as well. And um, I mean, if you have the time, you could certainly research some of the past agendas of the recent legislative sessions on, for example, the education committee and what kinds of bills they discussed that could give you an idea of the kind of things that they were already considering. And that's also a very useful if you're really trying to test out some new legislat legislation that you think are is going to make an impact. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, great. So let's see, we were talking about where things are at currently. Um, you know, I, th I think there's a, there are, you know, the topics that are coming up run the gamut as, as Maria had mentioned, you know, really, really minor things of commas here and semicolons there um, for some clarification on language all the way up to, you know, revolutionary ideas. Uh, you know, one thing, um, uh, you know, that, that, that got introduced, well, um, uh, 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 you know, again, you, you hear, I don't want to bring up anything controversial, right? I'm not trying to make a value judgment on, on, on any particular piece of legislation, whether it's good or, or bad or in between, but you'll see th stuff that's very controversial and then you'll see stuff that's very mundane. And so it really is, is a cornucopia of different types of ideas, different perspectives that are all coming together. Um, and um, maybe uh, I'll talk a little bit about education and, sure. and what CCSD is up to. Um, so uh, we have a platform um, that is posted on our on our website that I will share this website link with you all. That is really focused on a couple of primary primary points: um, student achievement. Of course, ensuring that our students are, are getting quality education in the classroom, um, that they're, that high quality outcomes is, is absolutely key. Part and parcel of that, of course, are the myriad of other issues um, that, that we need to continue to address as, as a state and as a community. Um, so school funding, obviously per pupil funding is, is, is very high up on the list. I'm sorry, in the link that I dropped, uh, if you scroll down to resources, you'll see a, a handful of, of different links that you can take a look at. The CCSD legislative platform, which is that first resource, is, is um, what I'm referring to here. So, uh, so, so student learning, ensuring that there's funding in place. And you may have heard the um, governor has proposed an additional, an additional $2 billion be put into the public education system um, over the next two years, which uh, for CCSD, more or less, would amount to about uh, an increase of about $2,000 per pupil, bringing us a little bit close, well, actually significantly closer to the national average. It doesn't get us all the way to optimal where we, where we would like to be. Um, but it absolutely makes a significant, it would be, assuming that it goes through, a, a, a truly unprecedented investment in uh, education in, in Nevada, in Nevada's history, quite frankly. Um, some other things that we're looking at are, are workforce, um, work-based learning. How can we ensure that students have access to professionals, to opportunities, to apprenticeships, to get them ready for college or career college and career, whatever choice uh, uh, they they may make um, based on that. We want to ensure that kids have the tools that they need to make those decisions for themselves. Um, in addition to that, governance and transparency. Um, you know, I don't think it's lost on anyone in Southern Nevada around sort of some of the challenges that we've seen um, over years past with, with governance structures and, and um you know, you see it in the news quite a bit, and and our board has really taken a stance of it's 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 critically important that we have strong governance, um, that we have strong boards of trustees, and that there is uh, an immense amount of transparency aligned to all of that, whether that be funding, the way that decisions are made, and 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 how the infrastructure all comes together that that wraps its arms around our our public education system, and then last but certainly not least, um, mental health and uh, safety. And that goes for both, you know, the adults that are in the buildings, as well as the kids recognizing that um, 
we need to honor the humanity of students and again, adults and, and, and support staff and administrators, everyone that's in the building while also balancing, right. This idea of um, ensuring that, that we're keeping folks, folks safe. Um, one thing that is continuing to bubble up is conversations around um, restorative justice practices in schools. Um, there was some legislation that was passed um, um, in previous session and, you know, we've seen some of that play out. And, and I think there is uh, uh, quite a bit of conversation right now that's happening in the legislative building around where do we go from here now that, you know, we've, we have um, had a little bit of time around implementation of restorative justice, regardless of what, again, this is totally um, um, devoid of, of uh, any sort of value on whether it's good or bad or, or, or otherwise, but just recognizing that there are, there are four bills one has just been um, significantly amended. One is likely coming from the governor's office, right, around these ideas of, of restorative justice, student discipline, and then ultimately safety of, of, of folks in, in, inside of school buildings that, um, if that's something that you're interested in, I know I certainly am, um, that I think that'll be an issue to, to definitely watch. Um, and so, yeah, those are those are sort of the high levels. We also have two bills, but I'll, I'll stop there. Like I said, I know I'm talking a lot here. Um, no, 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 please continue. It's okay. very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I alluded to this at the beginning, right? Which is um, uh, Clark County School District gets two bills that we get to um, um, bring forth um, and uh, work on sort of drafting the legislation and, and really, you know, pound the pavement on on seeing if there's um, uh, viability there. And so. Those are identified by the board of trustees, by our govern governing body um, for guidance. And then from there, what we do is, is as staff, as we work on, um, on making that language come to life. So uh, we've got Senate Bill 47, which, which I mentioned is, is looking at workforce conditions um, for um, folks in the public education system. Um, I think what you see now is, uh, you know, if you were to look that up on the legislative website, may uh, we've had a number of conversations internally with committee members, with with legislators um, to see how we might make this work. Um, but it really hits three components. One is taking a look at um, uh, uh, bringing a, a group of folks together that are statewide that represent the various different types of employee groups across public education and looking to have a, a collective, cohesive conversation um, about what are some structural policy things that we can put in place or that need to change mm -hmm. in order to support not just the recruitment and retention of teachers, um, but the overall working conditions that exist within public education, whether that be in a school building, in a central office, or in a state department of education. Um, recognizing that with unprecedented investment, a, a roadmap needs to continue to be built and iterated on that has voices, you know, from everyone across, across the state um, involved. We don't posit that we have all of the answers, um, which is why the, uh, we, we are proposing this. Um, the, the, the second part of, of that bill of SB 47 is just seeking to clarify existing language that is already in statute saying that boards of trustees can build um, what is currently the, the specific word in there is teacherage, teacher, A-G-E. So if you, if you could think of a parsonage or a vicarage, it's essentially housing um, for educators. And we're just looking to clarify the definition of teacherage. Which, you know, we could spend another entire uh, a, a webinar in talking about this process of creating legislation, how it gets implemented and through implementation, some of the things that come up that require uh, reconsideration of bill. And, and we can see a couple of examples where the legislature brings them back so that clarifications can be made, additions, uh, changes, amendments to the bill, because um, sometimes uh, when uh, uh, as much uh, work as it's put to draft the language in these bills and the participatory nature of how this goes through the process, there are some elements that until you try them out and you're implementing questions uh, come up uh, that need to been, be readdressed again by the legislative process. So it's, it's very interesting. It's, it's not necessarily all the time straightforward, right? And, and I also want to say sometimes the best solution from a policy perspective is not necessarily a legislative 
solution. Sometimes it's an administrative solution. Many times I talk to folks that are like, I wish I could pass this bill or put this forward. And I'm like, well, that sounds more like something that you could accomplish by changing administrative policy. You don't need to go to uh, create a bill for this. And so that's something to consider too, if you're moving into the policy space, that there are different places where you can enact change and create some very wonderful opportunities for folks that don't necessarily have to go through this process, right? There are spaces and topics and times for this, and there's others, but uh, there, it, it is very interesting to me and the need for the professionals that are implementing these policies to um, need to get clarification or revision. So it's, it's very commonplace. Absolutely. I will say the first question that I often ask myself um, when I'm reading through legislation is, does this need to be a state law <laughs> sure. or is there some policy somewhere that, that can, that can um, uh, rectify, rectify mm-hmm. this? And sometimes the answer is absolutely. Yes. Sure. It does need to be state law. And sometimes the answer is like, oh, maybe not so much. So sure, sure. Um, so it's, it's part of the policy process, right? Which it really is very, is. very interesting. Yeah. So, it really I, and I know the school district's very busy uh, <laughs> this, this session as well. And those are all very important um, bills and, and proposals moving forward. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. So um, I, I just want to add the last part of, of SB 47 is, is looking at teacher licensure specifically, um, recognizing that it's, you know, 180 plus dollars, depending on how many endorsements mm-hmm. you might have for initial licensure and then the renewal costs that, are, you know, are repeating costs. Something that we've heard a lot from educators is you just stick a bill. <laughs> off of our plates. Yeah. And so what we're hoping is to, to remove the sort of prohibitive um, cost of, of licensure, recognizing that folks are coming off of student teaching and not, you know, having the ability to, to, to be working for an income um, to, to, to either remove it completely or significantly lower that total amount. And so exactly to Maria's point, you know, some things need to be state law, some things don't, but in all of the maneuvering and conversations, this is a, a you know, a, a sort of ebbing and flowing process um, to get us to hopefully what will be a, a, a final, uh, final point at which we can push these, these ideas through. Senate Bill 65 is our other bill. I'm not even going to lay that out for you guys because that is really, truly in flux, but essentially it's looking at background checks um, and training requirements um, for boards of trustees. Uh, but um, I would say, yeah, hold, hold, yeah, hang on tight because that that may look uh, look a little bit different. Yes, and we can certainly we're going to show you how you can track bills and look at amendments and and just uh, uh, be on top of the in, bills that do interest you in this session or any other. Right from from um, uh, a, a search perspective, you can see a lot through the website, and we'll show you in a minute. Before we proceed, though, I would love to just talk a little bit about some of the topics of interest for higher ed that have emerged in this first few weeks. And uh, the interesting part to me is that there is obviously the, the, there are committees on uh, focused specifically on education, but education um, gets impacted by so many other aspects that are discussed in different committees and areas within the legislative process. And so, um, for example, you know, affordable housing, that's something that impacts our students and their ability to attend college, for example, or air quality, behavioral health, workforce development. Um, there's, there's things more direct like dual enrollment, right? Um, uh, or firearms on school and college campuses, discussions about that. Grad, graduate medical about education, healthcare, um, fee waivers, obviously immigration, obviously K through 12 is completely tied, is, is, is education in general. Um, just many, many things that how meetings are run, so Nevada um, uh, meeting law, voting rights. And so some of these topics may not appear to be directly related to education, but there's, there's uh, everything's interconnected. And so if you're interested in really um, monitoring the process of bills uh, in this legislative session, Make sure, and you're interested in, for example, education, make sure you also look at some of the other committee work because it may directly or indirectly tie to some of the topics of interest that you have. And so for us at UNLV, you can certainly um, look at the 
biannual, uh, biannual uh, funding priorities um, here by uh, looking at our website at UNLV. I'm also going to post it here so that you can look at it in the chat. And then basically, one second, <laughs> there it is. So they're, they're posted on our website and you can search from the government and community engagement page um, or use the link that I just shared. But some of the focus that you'll see there is on restoring um, a pandemic era budget cuts of approximately 12% and funding higher education to produce the skilled workforce that Nevada needs. Uh, so just as with K through 12, there's always a conversation happening about adequate funding uh, levels for the educational institutions of our state and how that impacts um, business, workforce development, and many, many other areas um, of, of, of our state. So definitely um, a lot of conversation regarding funding. Uh, UNLV is also seeking to align state funds to support student success. Again, the, the theme of helping our students succeed, and which is a core piece of our mission, and um, tying up the way student credit hours to a national measure of college costs. You can look more information in the, um, on the website and as these uh, conversations are moving along, um, you, know, uh, you can find some more details. Also, the K through 12 teacher pipeline is very important uh, and it has been established as a, um, as a priority, uh, as well as seeking approval of funds to expand medical education in Nevada, support competitive graduate assistance stipends and um, other uh, funding that is being requested is for an interdisciplinary science and technology building and a fine arts building. So it's supporting the infrastructure so that we can, um, you know, move, move, move the agenda forward. And it's important to, to mention, just as Patricia said, that for the platform to be uh, approved, it has to go through the right, uh, the right body. We do the same in higher ed. Uh, the chancellor and board of regions need to approve bills that are formally supported by the institutions and the, the Nevada system of higher education. And so if, right now, the bill that is being formally supported is Bill AB 37, which authorizes the establishment of Behavioral Health Workforce Development Center of Nevada at one or more institutions um, that belong to ENCHI. And this is one of the bills that is being supported and I'll show you how to track it. So that as an example in a minute, but um, as you see, we're in the agenda right uh, for this legislative session is pretty broad and there's a, there's a lot of work happening. So now let's, we get to uh, track a bill. Let's show you how, how we can do it. Um, there's a lot of information in the website that was created by the Nevada legislative session. Uh, Patricia, do you want to share or do you want me to share it? Yeah, I can share it. Perfect. Um, da, 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 sharing screen. Okay. So yeah, like Marie said, like this is a true treasure trove of historical information and current information. So when you go to the legislative website, which is ledge.leg, sorry, dot state dot nv dot us, this is the landing page that you get to. This is the legislative building, which it looks like um not in winter time like it is right now. Um <laughs> but um so let's see. Uh do we want to, so let's take a look at, at this session. So there's a couple of ways that you can go about it. You can go to, on this left-hand side, you can go to session info and then you can click, right? So we're in the 82nd session here. You can also look at previous sessions. So I think that's the really cool thing is you can go back and watch videos, read meetings, look at legislative pa like pages for individual bills for like, a number of years past. Uh, let's see how we can go back pretty far, actually. 1985, that's loaded onto this website. There's also um, law library info, general information, facts about Nevada, what's the legislative building. There's the Legislative Council Bureau that we were talking about, more research information, and then Assembly and Senate. This is going to show you the individual pages for your Assembly people and your Senators. Um, but what I do, especially if I'm looking for uh, bills, is I go straight to this Nellis that stands for something, but I don't know. Nevada Electronic Legislative Information System. That's probably a good, that, <laughs> yes. that, 
That's probably a good guess. Right. <laughs> so I've clicked on Nellis and here I am and, and I want to look for some legislation and I'll let you narrate, Maria. You just uh, tell me what you want to do. Yeah, no, go, go for it. You're, you're doing beautifully. <laughs> okay. So we want to look for, for a, a specific bill. We've heard about this bill. We've heard about, you said AB 37, correct? AB 37. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when I clicked on Nellis, what I can see is the daily schedule for today. All of the committees that are meeting when the full, um, when the full house is meeting, which is usually 1130, which is, oh, just kidding. It's on this side, the floor sessions, but then I can look here at these buttons and I can click legislation. I can look at all bills and resolutions. That's usually where I go when I know that the language exists. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to click there today. Yeah. And I think you mentioned this, but just for clarification, because I get this question a lot, uh, SB uh, um, means that it started in the Senate and AB means that it started, the bill started in the assembly. So that's why you see us referring to SBs or, or ABs. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it maintains its AB or an SB even when it makes its way over to the other house. So this for the entire session will always be AB1. Um, okay, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna type into the search box here, AB37, simple right. as that, I hit enter. You can also click apply filters and then it'll give me the search result, AB37. And what I can do is click on this guy and it's gonna pull up a whole bunch of information for this particular bill. So I'll see the summary, which is really just the headline, gives you a little bit of information about what this is about, when it was initially introduced. So this is a pre-file bill. So this is one of those government agency bills that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can see who is sponsoring it, the Assembly Committee on Education. We can uh, uh, click down for a little bit more. We can also see, is this going to be heard? anytime uh, in the near future or has it been scheduled to be heard in a committee. And we can see that this is going to assembly revenue, which is the money committee on the, on the assembly side on February 28th at 4 PM. I can click the agenda and that will take, take me to the agenda page as well as where I can view a uh, live stream, the meeting. YouTube is also a really great place to do that pro tip. Um, but then what I can do is click over here to text and this is going to show me the full bill language. Um, so it's got the bill number here. It's got the committee that it's been referred to. It's got who this bill is um, uh, being brought forth on behalf of. Whether there's a fiscal note, meaning is there, uh, is there a cost associated with this? And then it gives the Legislative Council's Digest is probably where I spend the most time when I'm reading bills. This gives you a very good summary of what does it look like currently? What is this looking to change? And then it's broken out into sections. And then when you get down here, you can see here's the actual law language. So the blue is the new text. And then when there are, uh, let's see, is there any red? Red would be taking out um, current text that exists. Mm -hmm. And then you, there are some other, other things when, when amendments happen, but this is where you can take a look at the, the initial um, bill information. And then when there are amendments and an updated sort of bill, that will all populate here that you can sure. click on and click through. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the um, amendment process, like if you if you were to go, this is from last legislative session, but if, if you don't mind uh, uh, going to SB 350, that's the promise program bill. Um, Say it one more time. It's SB uh, 350. Oops. Just to demonstrate, there you go. So revises provisions, right? And so when you go to the text, if you don't mind opening the text, just to show folks as you go down this, um, you can see the, the changes, right? It's very clear when you look at the bills, you can follow through what's being amended. And um, like you say, the, 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 the meetings are here um, set up, the amendments are listed. So it's, it's um, very useful to look at bills in the site. Yeah, the one thing I would add on here, and, and this is something that I didn't really pay much attention to until I really started diving into moving and shaking on the policy side is these fiscal notes. So if there is a, an agency or an entity that's impacted by the legislation that you, uh, you know, that is being proposed, 
um, the, the, the council bureau will reach out directly to that agency. So like for CCSD, we get tons of fiscal notes. UNLV, I'm sure gets even more, um, which is to say, okay, what would the financial impact be of this policy were it to be passed? And then you can click on it and you can see, okay, these guys got a fiscal note, but they're like, nope, there would be no fiscal impact. We're all good. No problem. Sometimes depending on what it is, this is hundreds of millions of dollars, just depending on, on the type of policy. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and then and just join, to, oh, sorry, go ahead. sorry, just to clarify, the amendment for promise didn't require one because there was already a fiscal note attached to the scholarship piece from the previous legislation. So it's also good to see when you're saying amendments or uh, pre pre revises, uh, revises to look at the previous one so that you get a complete picture of what the bill is like. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then if you're looking to track, so as a regular citizen for free, you can track up to 10 bills on this Nellis website. You would create an account, which is very quick. It's just ask, it just asks for your email address basically. And then um, essentially what you would do is just hit this track button. And um, it's really nice on the, in, on the internal side. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to sign in. Oh, maybe it will let me. So I can see like for me, because I have a, a, a government agency, political subdivision of a government agency um, uh, email address, I am able to track an unlimited amount of bills. So 160 is what is being tracked in my Nellis right now. And that all organizes and filters itself really well. Um, so I'll stop there. And I know Perfect. that we're getting short on time. Yes, we are just a few minutes away. So um I would uh, first like to encourage everybody again, if you want to get involved, we covered this a little bit and there's different ways to get involved, but you could also uh, feel free to send an email to this address, which is the National Institute for the Advancement of Education, NIAE at UNLV.edu. If you have more questions that we could answer, I would be happy to have a conversation offline to answer questions that I may be able to direct you to resources or individuals that can answer your questions. But certainly, if you want to get involved, there's a lot of opportunity to do that. Uh, we covered today very general information, but you know, we there's always room to, to be more um, specific about areas of interest that you may have. And before we open just a couple minutes for questions, I would really like to invite you to join the next presentation on the Scholarship in Practice uh, web uh, lecture series, uh, which is Tuesday, April 25th. Uh, so put that on your calendars, Tuesday, April 25th from four to five. And Dr. Claire Treadwell and Dr. Gina uh, Weglard's ward, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing my colleagues' names, um, are going to be presenting on innovation in connecting research and practice in early childhood. And I want to remind you that there are CEUs available for educators and licensed human service professionals for these series. So uh, we encourage you to participate. So uh, with that, I don't know if there's any other questions or comments that we have before we wrap this up. We don't see anything in the chat, but uh, Patricia, do you have any parting thoughts or comments? Just, I, I could not begin to stress enough, you know, that uh, especially if this is sort of your first intro or, or, you're, or you've been sort of minimally exposed, that it, it, it can feel daunting. It can feel like a lot, um, but truly your involvement as a citizen, as a community member is just incredible just so critical and really is what makes this process move forward. So I invite you, you know, pick your favorite news station and, uh, or, or news outlet and follow the legislative session that way. Come visit up in Carson City. One thing I think I neglected to mention is the Grant Sawyer building in Southern Nevada that's off of Washington and Las Vegas Boulevard is the Southern Nevada sort of satellite building for the legislature. So you, if you want to testify or give public comment on any bills, say whether or not you support or, or don't support something, you can go in person at, to that building to do that. So just there are many ways to, to engage, and, and I highly encourage you to, and, and I, I find it to be very gratifying personally, um, and, 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 and hope that that would be the same for you all. And I'm just going to drop also my email if, if that's okay, Please, or if no, you go would for it. We have, say, yeah, well, okay. While you do that, I also want to just acknowledge a couple of folks from the uh, uh, College of Education. So thank you to 
Genoshia Rivers, uh, Young Bok Kim, Nancy Weaver, and all those who facilitated today's webinar. And thank you uh, for everything. And, and yes, uh, uh, Patricia shared her email. I'll share mine as well, even though that I monitor the the, the team monitors the the one for the for the institute. But um, yeah, please please contact us and, and, and thank you so much for taking the time today to be with us. And thank you for your time, Patricia, and your knowledge. We appreciate it a lot. It's been a pleasure, everybody. Thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you today. all. Thank you, Maria. Take care. Bye.